Our Gospel reading this morning is from the 10th chapter of John, verses 1 through 10. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. And a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Beautiful job. Thank you for reading for us. Tom does so many great things around our church, and we are very lucky to have him as one of our members. Truly has a heart for mission. And before I share my communion meditation with you, I wanted to thank our jazz band. Oh, we're going to have the... That's right. We have... We're going to try something today. I still want to thank the jazz band. I don't want to not thank the jazz band. I want to thank Lynn and Catherine and Errol. Uh, and let me tell you, I've had many challenges in my life. And one of the greatest is trying to play Latin percussion in a robe. It just doesn't work. But we try. So we're going to try something a little bit different today. We're going to try to do a children's message um, for children of all ages. Okay? And so we want you to listen uh, because what I'm going to share with you is something important. It's a lesson about food and the difference between the kind of normal food that we eat and the food that we share in communion. So first I want to show you something. I want to show you, and I had to fight in the grocery store to get this one, a box of pasta. But I want to show you, actually it's been sitting in our shelf a while. But what I wanted to show you is this on the side, and I know you know what this is. It's the nutritional facts of this pasta. And it tells us about the vitamins and the calcium and the potassium. And then it gives us the total fat and, the, boy, a lot of carbohydrates in that. And uh, riboflavin and niacin and all these things. It tells us what the food is is made of or what's in the food to give us energy but it doesn't tell us what we are to do with that energy does it not at all I mean we know that it keeps us from being hungry for a while but then we get hungry again right we know that it keeps our bodies going and it keeps us alive that's what our food is for we know it gives us energy but there's nothing here that tells us what this food is for, what we are supposed to do with that energy. And that's the difference between this food and the food right here. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The bread and the cup. And I want to share with you, I decided I was going to make a label like this to show you what this food how this food directs us because it does tell us the things that we need to do with the energy that it gives us and it gives us a great deal of energy even though it's just a little bit it's amazing it gives us a great deal of energy so I made this it's actually a to-do list and it is a very very busy to-do list 
And I know it might be hard to see, but I'm glad to read it to you too. So this is kind of the label, the way I would label if we put communion in a box. This is the label that I would put on it. It starts with the priority, the due date, what we are supposed to do, who, whether or not it's in progress, and when it's done. So the first one is, the due date is now. In fact, if you look at all the due dates on this list, they are all now. Because communion gives us things, energy to do things for Christ that we're supposed to do right now. We don't put that off. Then the priority is one. There's no two, there's no three. Because everything we do for the Lord is a priority. It's important. So it's all ones on the priority. Now here's some differences in what things we do. So the due date is now, what do we do? We feed. Who do we feed? The hungry. In progress, we're supposed to be doing this. Done, and it says never. In fact, all of these, when it comes to done, say never, and all of them are always in progress. We're always supposed to be doing them. What's the next one? What are we supposed to do? Forgive. Who? Those who hurt us. We forgive them. What are we supposed to do? Help. Who do we help? Anyone in need. What are we supposed to do? Share what we have with those who don't have. That's who receives it. What are we supposed to do? Love. Who do we love? Jesus, your family, your neighbor, and all of God's creation. Here's another what. Give your time and your energy. To whom? To God and God's church. Here's another one. What are we supposed to do? Pray. Who? For others. For any others. For all others. So many need our prayers. Here's another one. What are we supposed to do? Believe. Who do we believe in? God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Here's, we got almost down to the bottom of the list. What are we supposed to do? Learn. What are we to learn? What Jesus teaches. And we're to share that lesson with the world. And the final one. We're to do right now. What are we to do? Change. And what are we to change? The world. And that is what we do for our Lord. So the energy that the food of communion gives to us helps us do those things. And it helps us do them not just until we get hungry again, but every day of our lives. Would you pray with me? And if you wish to repeat the prayer at home, you're welcome to do so. Dear Lord, we thank you for this holy food given to us out of your love, giving us the energy to serve you every day. Let us, Lord, do all the things that you call us to do. Amen. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit. Mm. Since the message of my children's sermon was food, that's what we're going to talk about as we think about communion today. I mean, from the very beginning of our society's struggle with COVID-19, there has been a great deal of talk about nutrition, particularly in the area of immunity. We've known for many decades that the strength of the body's immune system and good nutrition are interconnected. Considering the devastating transmissibility of this virus, there is a renewed awareness of the right foods we need to help us stave off or manage disease. Just recently, I ran across a very popular article on the internet titled, 16 Superfoods to Boost Your Immune System. How many of these foods do we recognize? 
And even more importantly, how many of these foods are a part of our diet? You probably already know some of them. They are, not particularly in this order, lemon, garlic, parsley, mushrooms, bell peppers, shallots, ginger root, chilies. That'd be real good around here because in yeah, south, southern Arizona, we, we eat a lot of chilies. Friendly bacteria, such as found in yogurt, elderberries, pumpkin and sunflower seeds, cinnamon, oranges, watermelon, broccoli, and salmon. Of course, if we eat those superfoods in some form every day, it is not a guarantee that we will avoid becoming ill. Even with the best diet, direct contact with an infected individual, particularly in the case of this virus, without common sense protections such as social distancing and gloves and masks, will not negate the probability of being infected. But the right diet that includes the superfoods will help our bodies resist some of the more devastating effects of viral and bacterial diseases. That's why we call them superfoods. The superfoods and their connection to the human immune system is not new information. It's been around for quite a while. But the typical American diet, as we know, has not easily adapted itself to healthier habits. Now, there are many reasons for this. Some of them having to do with factors in our culture, such as inequity of wealth, the politics of food and food production, and then, of course, our personal preferences of what, when, and how we eat. Think about right now, the extreme reaction that the pandemic has created in America due to the temporary closing of restaurants and bistros and bars. Think about the fact that many who have died from this virus have had comor comorbidities related to nutrition, such as diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Do you think America's eating habits will change as a result of COVID-19? Probably not. Because it is our nature that we would much rather take a pill to fix a problem than change our lifestyle and our habits to prevent one. Isn't that true? Even if it's in the face of serious illness, or death. Unfortunately, that is also the way that we as Christians sometimes view the act of communion in regards to the spiritual disease of sin. Like our unhealthy relationship with food, we would rather take a pill, an instant solution for the scourge of sin than embrace the change of heart and the change of life which this table manifests. I think an excellent place in the Gospels to see the point of the Lord's Supper is not just in the story of Jesus' Passover meal, but in parables such as that of the gate and the shepherd that Tom just shared with us. It's from John's Gospel. Let me share it again. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, 
he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Have it abundantly. In this parable, Jesus presents himself in two images. The shepherd who leads the sheep in and out of the corral and the gate of the corral itself, which is also the means, of course, by which the sheep are protected. This parable also presents the place to which the sheep are led, which is the corral, and from which the sheep are returned. The place to which, I'm sorry, the place to which they are led, led from is the corral. The place to which they are led to is the pasture. And we know, of course, what a pasture is. It's defined as land covered with grass or other low plants suitable for feeding, for feeding animals. In the Gospel of John, Jesus uses the image of feeding sheep in several ways. In this parable, Jesus presents himself as the shepherd who leads his followers both to the safety of the corral and back out into the pasture in order to feed them. In the final chapter of John, Jesus uses the image of feeding the flock once again. But this time, it is the resurrected Christ commanding Peter to become a shepherd to the flock. It's almost the last thing that Jesus says in John's gospel. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. In describing himself as the gate to the corral, Jesus is talking about his death upon the cross, which only he could accomplish. It is Jesus alone who, through his love and relationship with the Father, in his, his purpose as the Messiah, opens the door between earth and heaven, between God and humanity, between life and and the life eternal. Jesus proclaims this when he sits at table with his apostles. And I'll be saying these words or something similar to the words in a few moments when we share the table. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now that's Jesus describing him. That's the purpose of Jesus describing himself as the gate. In describing himself as the shepherd who leads the sheep in and out of the corral, Jesus is talking about his daily presence in the life of those who believe in him. Thus, Jesus is both the means by which believers are saved, that's the gate of grace, and beyond salvation, Jesus is the good shepherd who nurtures, directs, and sustains our lives. In both images, we see the totality of what it means to follow Jesus what it means literally to be a Christian. 
Salvation and purpose. Salvation and purpose and meaning in life. That is why as we gather around our table this morning, we are not just taking a pill, so to speak, for our sins. The healing that we receive through this meal gives us new life. We who are Christ's sheep become Christ's shepherds. Nurtured by grace, we are able to go out and nurture others with the love taught to us by the Son of God. And that love, as we know, is not a one-time medication. It is a lifestyle. It is a way for us to live our lives. Theologian Karl Rahner, in his book, Encounters with Silence, describes with great beauty the lifestyle of love that is affected by our communion with Christ. This is what he writes. Only in love can I find you, my God. In love, the gates of my soul spring open, allowing me to breathe a new air of freedom and forget my own petty self. In love, my whole being streams forth out of the rigid confines of narrowness and anxious and self-assertion, which makes me a prisoner of my own poverty and emptiness. In love, all the powers of my soul flow out toward you, wanting nevermore to return. Now you'll notice that in that passage, Rahner says absolutely nothing about the mechanics of communion. He doesn't even use the sacramental words. Instead, he talks about in that how the table changes us as we live out our faith in the world. It is the gate, as he says, by which our souls spring open. That is what makes the bread and the wine a spiritual superfood. It strengthens our resistance to temptation. It enables our souls to not only forsake what is wrong, but to embrace and achieve what is right. It gives us a purpose that goes from the boundaries of physical life to the boundless and abundant life. That's the word Jesus uses. Abundant life of discipleship. And that is a life measured not in years or by breaths or heartbeats, but measured in love. Today, this table is the gate through which we pass from sickness to health, from death to life, and from malaise to meaning. Today, this table calls us out to be shepherds, a people who define their lives by caring, by the caring that we give to other lives. That's what a shepherd does. Today, we come to hear the very question that Jesus asked of Peter. Do you love me? And we come together, taking this holy food to provide the answer. Yes, Lord, you know we do. And we will show it to you by opening the gates of our hearts, letting our faith pour out, and feeding your sheep, O oh Lord, with the superfood of your love. It is the only food ever that ever has been and ever will be that lets us live forever. Amen.